Hi, everyone. My name is Bill Hose, the Assistant Executive Director at LSRPA. Welcome to DEP Topical Presentation Number Five. I'm your moderator for this session. The DEP panelists in this session, <laughs> excuse me, will provide a brief PowerPoint presentation with time allotted at the end of the session for topical questions from the audience. Questions should be submitted through the comment window available on the presentation platform on your device. This session will end promptly after 30 minutes. If we're unable to get to a specific question, please submit that question directly to the presenter's email addresses. In this session, we are joined by Mike Fowler and Nicole Kalagian. Mike will be discussing some general receptor evaluation issues and highlighting some administrative issues with respect to VI submissions. Nicole is joining us to field questions on VI should they arise. Mike has been a member of the Bureau of Inspection and Review for nine years, and he specializes in vapor intrusion and has participated in various aspects of the program, including inspection review and program development. Nicole has been with the department for three and a half years. She's a research scientist in the Bureau of Environmental Evaluation and Risk Assessment. Nicole serves as a DEP contact for vapor intrusion investigation and mitigation and EPH. Nicole is also an ecological risk assessor. Please welcome Mike and Nicole. And I'm good, all right. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. And I, I was in this morning's sessions. It seemed like we got a good crowd and I hope we have a good crowd here this, uh, listening in, some of whom I'm sure I've spoke with before. And it's unfortunate we can't be in person. And this is my first time using this platform. So uh, hopefully I'm not the exception to how well it went this morning. And of course, thank you to the LSRPA and the department for making this happen. I understand this has been kind of a crazy year and uh, we made it work. Like Bill said, I'm with BIR and I'm gonna be discussing some of the more common technical deficiencies associated with general receptor evaluations and more specifically, vapor intrusion investigations. There are multiple components to the receptor evaluation associated with groundwater and potable wells. And of the things listed here, a well, a well search, door to door survey and potable well sampling are required even if the contamination has not left the site. Again, these are just some common issues the receptor team in BIR runs into. To that effect, delineation of contamination, soil or groundwater, is not a precluding factor con to conducting a receptor evaluation. With regard to the door-to-door -door survey, the idea is that the, the LSRP demonstrate everything was done to confirm that no one is drinking contaminated groundwater. Professional judgment here about how the door-to-door -door is completed may include letters, certified or otherwise, but the department expects 100% compliance. Therefore, physically knocking on doors may end up being a component of the door-to-door -door survey. And just to be clear, on uh, 100% compliance, this means a response from every single property. This applies irrespective of COVID-19. Remediation is considered an essential service. So here, this slide emphasizes, again, some of what was on the previous slide with regard to the requirement to complete a door-to-door -door survey. The first bullet, door-to-door -door survey must be completed when any potable or irrigation wells are within one half mile of each point of groundwater contamination taken directly from the tech regs. It has to be completed for the RI to be considered complete. Somewhat of a less persistent issue is the second bullet point here. To ensure that the well search is up to date every two years and is reported appropriately in the receptor evaluations, this being the updated receptor evaluations for both the RI and the RA. This situation becomes a little bit more unique when historic fill is the only contamination at the site, at which point the requirements for the well search and well canvas, and any subsequent potable well sampling that may be necessary, are limited to the site boundaries. However, the ecological evaluation is still required. If the only contamination is historic fill, the drivers for the receptor evaluation become the historic fill technical guidance and the ecological technical guidance. Moving on to vapor intrusion, and this is kind of where I specialize here. So this first bullet point here has become a much more persistent issue across a variety of uh, phase submissions is that there's an insufficient number of soil gas samples. A vapor intrusion investigation requires collecting an appropriate number of samples in the appropriate locations. This is a technical requirement. And I apologize if you hear my cat crying in the background. That's it's just work from home life. Um, and coupled with the technical guidance, 
there is a minimum number of samples based on the square footage of the building. This is vital to understand the conditions beneath the slab while accounting for spatial vari variability. To this effect, a single soil gas sample is insufficient to evaluate a single family residence. At minimum, two samples should be used in this situation. And of course, this can give this be flexible. I believe it's about 1500 square feet is, is the presumed size of a single family residence. There are conditions, of course, which more samples may be necessary or recommended. However, any less would require scientific technical justification for which VI would not occur. This next point here, the second point listed, that soil gas and indoor air sampling greater than five years old, that is not reevaluated in the RI and RAR submissions. The LSRP has an obligation to evaluate the VI pathway and any other receptors in an ongoing basis and reporting as such in the RIR and RAR. It's just a frequent deficiency that there's a lack of recent data. Soil gas and indoor air are highly susceptible to spatial and temporal characteristics. Just like any other media, things change over space and time. Data collected over five years ago does not represent current conditions and should be reconsidered. The vapor intrusion investigation and receptor evaluation are an iterative stepwise process that may warrant additional sampling. The short version of this is that if recent groundwater persists above the groundwater screen level, an updated vapor intrusion investigation is warranted. Further, and this is a frequent issue with, with historic results, is that when there is historic results above the soil gas screen levels, then monitoring is and has been warranted as well. I apologize, my cat is literally walking across the screen. Um, <laughs> uh, where was I? So this is, I apologize that I have lost my spot here. Uh, the phone's ringing, the cat's walking across the screen. This is crazy. Okay, so an example of this might be certification and submission of an RIR in 2020, where 2014 soil gas and indoor air results were used to support the updated receptor evaluation. In this instance, if groundwater persists above the groundwater screen level, then you should have recollected soil gas and indoor air samples. The third bullet, indoor air samples must be collected when contamination is present in soil vapor, regardless of the contaminant of concerns present in groundwater. Discovery of a contamination of contamination in soil vapor above the respective screening levels triggers the collection of indoor air. Volatile compounds in soil or groundwater offer the potential for vapor intrusion. It's not exclusively designated that groundwater act as the source. The department has no soil screening levels for the VI pathway. An exceedance of the soil gas screening levels necessitates further evaluation of the VI pathway. A common situation here may include a, a former auto repair facility where hydrocarbons are the only contaminant of concern in groundwater, but PCE is then detected in soil vapor. If the indeterminate pathway status does not apply, indoor air should be collected. It is not uncommon to find minor detection detections of dechlorinated solvents at sites to, uh, that had former parts cleaning or automotive repair. Before I get into this slide, I'd just like to say that a vapor intrusion investigation includes the collection of samples and data. And a vapor intrusion investigation must be completed if the building or structure is seldom occupied, not occupied, will not be occupied, cannot be accessed, or is scheduled to be raised. Any of this or any variety of this, it has to be completed. There are no regulatory provisions precluding certain buildings or structures from completing a vapor intrusion investigation. This includes occupancy or the building's operations. Obviously, there is there is some um, difference here with regard to indeterminate pathways that I believe Nicole discussed earlier. The investigator has to consider current and future occupancy. This was stated in the department's June 2013 RI policy statement, which was then superseded by the January 2020 RI complete policy statement. Any variance, and the point I've made a few times, any variance from completing the vapor intrusion investigation requires scientific technical justification. A situation that I've seen at least twice is that you have a climate controlled, so it's sealed, sword facility with either no sampling or insufficient sampling. It must be properly investigated, whether it address employees, any occupants, and any future use. 
deferring any administrative or investigative action with regard to the vapor pathway is not protective. Which leads me to this next bullet here, that contamination in soil gas is related to a suspected offsite source or commingled plume. Vapor intrusion investigation is to be completed within 150 days of the discovery date of the contamination. This includes discovery of historic contamination. If there is a suspected offsite source, it's not acceptable to just wait until the PA is completed or the RAO is issued. If the contamination, the contamination should be called in to the department's hotline if it's a suspected offsite source and then investigated. The offsite source guidance does not alleviate the PRCR from its obligations to complete a proper investigation and remediation. So again, until the confirmed, verified, unknown offsite source REO has been issued, the receptor evaluation, including any potable well or VI components, must be completed. Now, issuance of the, uh, of the REO does a few things here, and it is mentioned and recommended in both the commingled plume and the offsite source technical and administrative guidance that the REO be issued. Issuance of the REO, like I said, does a couple things. It unlinks the contamination from the site, and the department will begin to investigate the actual source of the contamination. It removes the responsibility from the contamination from your client, the RAO as a standing legal document, and it discloses the condition, the condition at the site exists. That's discloses to any interested party, including the PRCR, property owner, potential purchaser, health department, or like I said, anyone else that may be interested here. And uh, thanks for taking the time uh, to, from your, or thank you for the time uh, to allow me to speak today. And I'm happy to field any questions regarding the receptor evaluation. But uh, again, my primary focus is vapor intrusion. The primary contact for the receptor evaluations in the left top left hand corner is Diane Gard. Uh, she couldn't be here today, but her contact is shown. Additionally, Nicole, who spoke earlier today, she's here as well. Um, she can um, assist in answering any of these questions or any more technical issues should they come up. Uh, but just as a reminder, we're not really here to speak about any. Uh, site-specific questions, but any general questions are fine. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we're going to open the floor up at this point for folks to uh, submit some questions via comments. We'll give it another minute or two here to see if we have any comments come in. No problem. Sorry, I can't believe I, the, the interruptions were, were something else on that, huh? That's okay. You did great. Okay, we have a question. Um, so based on your presentation, we cannot rely on VI sampling from 2015 or if we are still investigating remediating groundwater that we have to complete again. I say that's a true or false. If the groundwater, so the, the data was from what year, Bill? 2015? It says 2015. Okay, if you're gonna certify a document now, an RIR or an RAR, in 2021, the data is over, older than five years. This is taken directly from the VIT. If the groundwater data is older than five years old, you should be reevaluating. Re that said, the data, the groundwater data ideally is recent, 2020, 2021, 2019. If it persists above the groundwater and stream level, the pathway should be reevaluated. That would include soil, gas, or indoor air samples should they be necessary. Okay, uh, another question here is with regard to door-to-door -door surveys, if the owners or tenants do not respond or won't answer, what are the options? This is a, this is again, a very common issue that you pursue alternatives in that if you need to knock on the door, you need to knock on the door. Typically the, the requirement to do this was based on you physically knocking on doors. If that's unreasonable, there should be multiple, multiple lines of evidence provided that support no one is drinking 
the, the or no, there is no potable wells in the area and no one is drinking potable well water. That may include contacting uh, local municipal, municipal water facilities to find out if these buildings have hookups, uh, visual surveillance to determine if there is any, any potable wells, um, just by visual appearance of the property or an assessment of the property. Multiple lines of evidence to support that in that case. We have another question here, Mike. If the groundwater concentrate, and this, this goes back to one of the questions we had earlier about relying on a uh, sampling done from 2015. If the groundwater concentrations have dropped, can't the reevaluation be a recognition that the related VI impact is expected to be characterized previously or a lesser impact? I'm gonna say that, I mean, Nicole, if you wanna voice your opinion, but that's that, that refers to like speculation. And with regard to receptors, I'm not comfortable speculating. If you want to support that with data and you want to come in with the technical scientific justification that supports the fact that there is no way that vapor intrusion could be above standard at this point, if there would have to be, I mean, Nicole, did you want to voice an opinion on this? No, I think you're on the right track. I mean, speculating isn't scientific. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's not a multiple line of evidence speculation. So uh, I, I agree with what you were saying, Mike. You know, and of course, this this it's hard to say without looking at what was there previously. But that said, just at face value as a general question, despite the decrease in groundwater concentrations, I mean, is there is there possi possibly um, degradation compounds here? What are we talking about? You should be reevaluating the pathway at that point. Do not speculate what's beneath the slab. It's a receptor issue. And also some of the more recalcitrant VOCs, those still might have somewhat of an effect through the VATO zone at that point. So um, it's not necessarily indicative that vapor intrusion isn't occurring uh, based on a decreasing trend. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, and I believe this is related to the door-to-door um, -door surveys, um, or maybe it's actually sampling, but it's, the question is basic. How do you get access how about you get access to a few buildings, but not all of the buildings? Is that acceptable? Again, this would be multiple lines of evidence. Um, if you cannot get access to all of the buildings, the LSRP should go out and find supporting multiple lines of evidence. And again, the first one that comes to mind is finding out if there is a municipal hookup to that structure. That's the first one that comes to mind. But if you cannot get access and no one will answer the door and you've got the evidence that supports that you've sent multiple mailings, certified mailings, you've gone there and knocked on the door twice and they won't answer, they won't send anything back. Finding alternatives to how to demonstrate and prove that no one is drinking the contaminated water. That is the standard set for is the door-to-door -door survey complete? Is no one drinking the contaminated water? Okay, thank you, Mike. Um... You'll hold it on for another minute if there are any more questions. Uh, if not, we will end up um, stopping this session and going to wait about 10 minutes for the next session. So we'll leave it open for another minute for questions. So it's just a clarification on that previous question that talks about there's a hookup to municipal to public water, soil vapor sampling for an accessible building is below limits. So I believe that they, they're, they're referring in that circumstance to um, they've done an evaluation in accessible areas. Uh, um, is this door to door? So you said both. Can you ask again, Bill, what was that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to follow um, this particular set of questions uh, about access. Um, and it looks like it might be more of a site specific question because there's some specific details about public water and vapor sampling. So if we have not been clear on that particular question, what my suggestion would be is to provide an email with more detail to help answer that question. If, yeah, so Nicole's information is listed there and also so is Diane's. Diane is the receptor contact and Nicole is the VI contact. If you want to contact either of those um, emails, then um, we'll know we'll know what it is, and uh, we can certainly put our heads together and get back to you. Okay, we do have a, a, a general question here for indeterminate pathways. Oh, and something just covered it up for indeterminate pathways to be applicable, sub slab must be completed. Correct. 
Correct. It is. It, it is. It is a the acceptable variance. It is a variance for the indeterminate pathway. However, soil gas must be completed. That again refers to the the um, 2020 all right complete policy statement that you have to have knowledge about the current and future occupancy. Okay, last call for questions. One's come in. Uh, when mapping the identified potable wells in a well search, is it proper to just rely on these well search coordinates? I have seen a number of issues where, where they are just um, poorly geolocated and are not placed in the right uh, locations. This would only become an issue if you had to sample the well or reevaluate the well. Um, or of course, if it triggered, if it was the only well that triggered a door-to-door -door survey. It's hard for me to say this is up to the LSRP to determine if the well is appropriately mapped, if its coordinates are right. That's <laughs> That's hard to say. I mean, uh, if if it if it triggers either potable well sampling or a door to door survey, then if you feel that it's incorrectly placed or at the wrong location, you should be double checking it to determine if you need to do the do the door to door survey or potable well sampling or not. This is should you check all of them? Well, I, I sure, but only if it triggers something else. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Uh, for the potable well search, what do you suggest if we identify applicable well permits but no matching well record? I would refer that question to uh, Diane. Again, my, my specialty in this was VI, and um, that's why Diane uh, is listed as the, the receptor evaluation contact. Okay, uh, any further questions for Mike or Nicole? All right, thank you, Mike and Nicole. We certainly appreciate the time to, uh, to come by and give us that informative presentation. Um, we are at 2.52, so it'll be an eight minute um, blank screen until the next presentation starts at three o'clock. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Stay well. Yes, the next presentation will be in this same room.
says I'm in the show, but I don't think I should be in the show. You are muted, Bill. Just one of these days, I'll figure that out. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last of the scheduled DEP topical presentations. My name is Bill Hose, Assistant Executive Director at LSRPA. I'm your moderator for this section. The DEP representatives in this session will provide a brief PowerPoint presentation with time allotted at the end of the session for topical questions from the audience. Questions should be submitted through the comment window available through the presentation platform on your device. If we are unable to get to a specific question due to time constraints, please submit that question directly to the presenter's email address. In this session, we have three presentations from four speakers. Matt Hose and Maria Pinke will be discussing when program interests are created and case mergers and the requirements for requesting them. Subsequent to Matt and Maria, Tyrone Jordan will be providing an overview of the new SID and addressing how to fix commonly seen errors found in SIDs during remedial phase report submissions. The session will close with Scott Terrell discussing error messages which sometimes appear in the online system when users are trying to upload a report and the required case which will house the report has not been created yet. Scott will also discuss how to resolve that problem. Matt is an administrative analyst in the data quality unit of the Bureau of Case Assignment and Initial Notice. He specializes in administrative guidance, data administration, and technical support. Maria has been with the department for approximately 14 years, and she's the manager of the data quality unit in the Bureau of Case Assignment and Initial Notice. Tyrone works in the Bureau of Information Systems and has been with the department since 2007. And Scott is a section chief in the Information Resources Program, overseeing online services development and support. Scott has worked in water resources as a case manager and also served in the water supply program. Please join me in welcoming Matt, Maria, Tyrone, and Scott. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Matt Hose, and today I'll be presenting with Maria Pinke. Um, as stated, Maria and I work in the data quality unit of BKane, where we handle a variety of requests ranging from data errors to administrative guidance. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'm going to give you a brief overview of how we assign our PI numbers. Um, in site remediation, PIs represent sites. They are representative of locations rather than responsible parties or property owners. Uh, our goal is to maintain one PI number per site. That PI number will contain all current and historic cases, permits, and UST registrations. There can be several different investigations ongoing at a site at one time, and we use LSR activities to separate them. Each LSR activity can have its own person responsible for conducting remediation, allowing us to break out who is responsible for which investigation at the site. So as a common example, you can have a property owner remediating historic fill on their site while at the same time there's a PSE and G transformer leak on the property. Both cases would be tracked under the same PI since they're at the same site, but one would have the property owner as PRCR and the other would have PSE and G, allowing us to have separate responsibility and separate billing. And then finally, uh, multiple block and lots can be grouped together to create a site, but those lots must be contiguous or adjacent and they must be owned by the same entity. Next slide, please. So as you can imagine, with all the constant development and redevelopment that occurs across New Jersey, it becomes difficult for us to maintain the one PI per site structure. So in order to preserve the history of a site and to try to keep our data as clear as possible, we use something that we call site XREFs. Site XREFs allow us to link different PI numbers to show that the two have some sort of overlap and relationship. So a common example of this is a subdivision. The PI that represents the site um, when it was whole becomes what we call the original site and each PI that is created for the sites established as a result of the subdivision are linked to the original site with a subdivided site label. Now, since these changes can happen in many different ways, they are always evaluated by our group on a case-by-case -case basis. Next slide, please. So you may have already ran into this concept if you have a site with a deed notice that was subdivided. Each subdivided site needs its own deed notice and soil or media action permit. So our group will create PI numbers for each of the subdivided sites for you to use on your per permit applications. If the subdivision occurs while your investigation is still ongoing, the case can remain intact under the original PI as long as there is a still a single PRCR and as long as the case remains in compliance. A single ARIA will be issued under the original site and PI, and then the permits will be placed under each of the subdivided site's PI numbers. Next slide, please. <laughs> And we do have a report on data miner that will allow you to see the sites that we have XREFed. 
you can find the cross-reference sites report under the sites and cases section. All you have to do here is plug in your PI number and the report will show you any other PI numbers that we have extra to that site. If you believe that a site is missing or has been mistakenly linked, you can contact us to evaluate it. You'll have our contact information a little bit later in the presentation. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Maria, who's gonna give her an overview on managing LSR activities. Thank you. Maria, you might be muted if you're talking. Good to know. Thank you, Matt. Um, I will now discuss the advantages and disadvantages of merging a case or activity. In some instances, there are multiple cases under the same PI that have the same responsible party or person responsible conduct remediation. So in order to avoid multiple fees, it would be beneficial to merge the activities thereby consolidating the annual fees. The other benefit of merging the activities is that you get to submit one set of reports as opposed to several of them with different SIDs, CEAs, deed notices, and RAOs. There are, however, disadvantages, and those are the fact that all AOCs will need to adhere to the earliest time frame of the oldest case. This could mean that in some instances, those time frames can result in direct oversight, so it's a risk that needs to be assessed. Now that we know the advantages and disadvantages, we ask, what's our next step? Well, that's easy. If you want to merge cases, all the activities to be merged must have the same responsible party. If any of the activities have different responsible parties, then a site and contact information update form should be submitted for the activities that need the update prior to the merge. The form can be submitted to our SRP underscore submissions email, along with supporting documentation if it warranted. The activities to be merged should be in the same remedial level, which means that they should be in the same reporting stage. If one of the activities is in the RI stage and the other is in the RA stage, then the RI of the one activity needs to be completed prior to requesting the merge. Last but not least, we require a letter from the responsible party requesting the merge. This letter should list the cases or activities, meaning LSRX with LSRY, and they should include an acknowledgement that the earlier time frame will apply, as well as an acknowledgement that once the cases are merged, they will not be unmerged. All cases are eva evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis because the details of the merges always vary in some degree. Once we conduct the merge of activities, we add the cases to the Alt ID window in the activity that remains active, and you will be able to verify this through the data miner report for alternate IDs in an activity. I'm sure you're all familiar with data miners since we have developed lots of reports for your assistance. If not, you can just search by category, choose site mediation, click submit, and under sites and cases, choose alternate IDs for selected PIs. You should be able to see all the cases that are associated with the activity. Lastly, here's our contact information. If you want to request a case, merge a new PI, or want assistance with issues dealing with timeframes or data miner errors, you can email your request to the SRWM Engines email, which I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. If you have questions, I will ask you to hold on to them and save them till after the next presentation. Thank you. So, um, Bill is, needs to be let back into the presentation, Marianne or Eric. Okay, thanks. So Tyrone, I think you're coming up next, right? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so my screen has been shared. There we are. There we are. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Bill. And also thank you, LSRP, for having us again this year. Um, uh, we look forward to sharing information with you. And today we will be discussing, um, we're gonna give you SID instructions as well as how to fix common SID errors that we do see. Next slide. Hmm. Okay, can you see my next slide? Yes, yes. Yeah. Great, all right, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, um, 
with regards to the um, SID instructions, um, hopefully you've seen this. Have you seen the new SID instructions? They were updated on January 25th, um, 2021. Um, uh, if you haven't, please do so. The SID instructions, um, the, there's a link at the bottom of this slide, but if you go to the DEP SRP forms page, you can find the SID, uh, the SID instructions there. Um, it's about a five page document and you should be able to see that um, and at the end, you'll find the frequently asked questions there too. And those are questions that we've um, recently encountered, you know, through the phone and through email. And that will kind of al help alleviate some of the issues that you're having probably before you even reach out to us. So be sure to, um, to check that out. Um, if you notice now recently, um, our SID has a new look to it. And um, this is version 1.5. Um, it now has a two buttons that you'll see at the top of the SID. It's validate for upload and enable for editing. Um, I wanna talk about the, the button with the red arrow, um, validate for upload. Once you click that button, you'll get a pop-up window which will allow you to finalize or lock the report. So by finalizing the report, you're gonna either click yes or no. Um, this will allow you to check for errors. And um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. As you can see, the errors have come up and we've got some work to do. Um, the first uh, paragraph that you'll notice, it's um, saying that the activity number is in the wrong format. Um, at the DEP, you may refer, hear us refer to that as either the activity number or the case number. Um, and then the next uh, uh, thing that you'll notice, you'll see two warning messages and then you'll see the AOC status is required. And you'll see several cells in column F that need to be fixed. So, um, so let's get to work. On the next slide, you'll see, you didn't have to remember all that from the pop-up message. You will see that the rows are, uh, the cells are highlighted in a bright pink color. So you know which cells that you have to address. Um, first of all, like we discussed in the previous slide, the activity number needs to be um, fixed as well as the AOC status uh, cells that we discussed in column F. Once you've um, addressed those errors, um, you have the chance to um, finalize the SID. Um, again, by clicking yes uh, to finalize the SID. One thing that we have noticed, um, we do get this question commonly from LSRPs, um, the NJDEP ID, which is column I, um, you'll note, uh, People have a tendency, they want to put an AOC ID there. You don't do that, just leave that blank. If this is your first SID upload, um, you're not gonna have that ID. So um, just leave that blank and that will be that will work. And then um, how do you know that um, this SID, the new SID is locked? Okay, if you click on the, uh, like this top row um, and the AOC type and the, and the button, uh, the drop down choices don't appear, you know that the SID has been locked. So if you click on that cell, nothing happens, the SID has been locked. Um, another question that we get is the, after you've uploaded that, uh, that SID to the portal, um, you'll see that new AOC will be populated, yes. You wanna keep that as yes, that comes up frequently. Um, just think of it as new to the system. Yes, it's new to the system. So you, once you encounter the SID upload confirmation, you'll encounter the SID upload confirmation again. And here you'll see the, the warning messages about the comm center numbers or incident numbers. But again, AOC, uh, um, new AOC equals yes. And then um, this is uh, regarding the SID 1.3 and 1.4. We just got a question about this uh, less than an hour ago. Um, and the uh, caller wanted to, know, emailer wanted to know um, when should they send the SIDs to a converter or when, or when do, uh, or, or, or do they lock it? So if you have SID uh, 1.3 or 1.4, which you can see at the top of your SID spreadsheet, um, it'll have 1.3 or 1.4 or 1.5, which is the new SID. If it's 1.3 or 1.4, you need to send it to this address um, below, uh, which is our SID converter. You'll receive the SID back um, and after a, a few minutes, um, and then you'll be able to upload that to the portal. And all as 
always, if you have questions, you can also read out, reach out to us at NJDEP Online Support if you have issues with your AOCs at the case. So I'm gonna turn that over to Scott. Scott's gonna give you more information regarding our, um, our, our, our online portal. Thank you. Thanks, Tyrone. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. So um, I'll just mention that um, the new AOC equals yes is always for the first upload. And then when you do like a PA, and then when you do a subsequent upload, like the RI, and you've uploaded the SID before, then that AOC is not new to the system anymore. And you definitely do not want that to be yes. If it's yes, um, you have the potential of Scott, I'm sorry. And uh, many Scott, people have, yes. I think you need to uh, advance your slides. Oh, okay. Yes, Tyron, can you? So, so here, um, I just wanted to mention that about the SID stuff. So um, I'm gonna talk about report upload issues. And, um, you know, if um, many of you LSRPs and your staff um, have seen this red error message when you were trying to go through a service, um, commonly you'll have an SI that you want to upload and you'll go into the PI that, you know, you did the work on and you get this message. The system has determined the facility you have selected does not contain an appropriate case for this submission. Please make sure you, you have selected the correct facility. Um, kind of a related error message is there's two. One may say there is no LSRP um, retained for this case. Um, and then on certification, some of you have gotten, you are not the LSRP retained for the case that you have selected. So this will hopefully address some of those, those issues. Next slide, please. So the, this is the key is that right now, although we are working on um, some of these other submissions, uh, these three items uh, can't be uploaded um, on DEP Online at this current time. Um, one is the RARs being submitted to terminate a deed notice or modify a remedial action permit. Um, the reports must be submitted with the appropriate remedial action permit application or deed notice termination form. And then I have the um, address there. You can find the information uh, in the wrap section of um, the SRP forms page. Uh, another one is um, child care PAs and REOs where there was no contamination found. Um, there is a child care form and there's a link there to the child care form and that needs to be filled out and submitted uh, to the address um, that's in the form, but you can email it um, also. And then finally, submissions for traditional oversight cases, um, such as CERCLA, they have a traditional oversight report certification form and uh, the address is there uh, under SRP oversight. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Just go back one. Great. So um, we're gonna go off to the forms page and we're gonna find the case creation request form. This includes um, three additional uh, scenarios that um, will create the case for you. Next slide, please. So when you open up that form, this is what you get. There's three options at the top. Next slide, please. So the case creation form covers the CDN for his um, historic fill only. And as it says, this can only be used to submit a CDN when historic fill will be the only contaminated AOC in the case. If there's an us discharge or something like that, um, or just even an us, um, you know, this can't be used. So it's very rarely used and that's why it's just maintained on paper like this. Um, the second choice is for a Madden subject educational facility when a case is needed for that. Um, and last, sometimes um, 
a property owner wants an REO for their property, but there's no trigger, no statutory or regulatory requirement. So the case creation form gives us all the information that we need in order to uh, create the case in that scenario. Next slide, please. So the case creation form would be filled out and scanned. It has signatures on it, so scan it or take pictures of it and send to srpsubmissions at dep.nj.gov. Next slide, please. So the last um, paper case creation that we're gonna go over is um, fairly rare, like the case creation form, um, us facility certification questionnaire. There's a scenario when the um, owner or operator submits this form, if the, um, if it's a clean closure, uh, nothing else has been submitted, but the FCQ shows an UST removal um, that has never been recorded before, um, then the um, UST registration staff uh, should create a case for that. And then the trigger date for that would be the um, earliest UST removal you know, that's displayed on that form, so usually the UST removal date. Um, so in that case, um, the Bureau of Case Assignment and Initial Notice, BCAIN, will create the case. And um, when they create the case, um, an SI is due within one year of the removal date. Next slide, please. So next we're moving to the online systems. And um, this, we're back to the forms page again and you can access the online systems from here or go directly to NJDP online. And we have the confirmed discharge notice, the general information notice, uh, LSRP notification of retention or dismissal, specifically for childcare in this case, and then the UST notice of intent to close. Next slide, please. Okay, so first we're gonna cover uh, retention childcare. So if you were to file a uh, retention for child care case and you don't pick a case or and especially if you don't pick a PI, um, then that will trigger um, BCAIN again to go in and create a case for you. And they'll reach out with the PI number and, and activity number for that um, child care licensing um, LSR activity. Um, and then we have the confirmed discharge notice. When a confirmed discharge notice is filed, um, it has to be filed within 14 days after um, an incident number is called into the hotline. And the CDN, when it's filed, will almost always create a case unless a case is picked in the case selection page in the service. So you'll almost always get a case this way, but you know, be aware that there is a case selection page in there. And if you pick the case, the um, incident uh, that you're running the service for will get linked into that other case, so be careful with that. Uh, for the confirmed discharge notification, um, the trigger date for that is um, actually the um, incident occurrence date um, you know, in the actual incident record itself. Next slide, please. Okay, so two additional online pathways. Um, if you file a new ISRA general information notice or GIN, um, that will create a case every single time. And um, the trigger date in that um, is the earliest of um, one of the ISRA triggering events that's um, included in that service. And then finally, we have the notice of intent to close an underground storage tank, um, NOI, and that will rarely create a case, and it will only create a case when no case is picked in the service and one or more of the USTs that is included in there is out of compliance. So that rarely you know, will create a case. And then for that, BCAIN will determine the trigger date based on the dates that the USTs have gone out of compliance. Um, so if you have questions about online systems, I put the NJDP online support email address there. 
So the confirmation email for these online services will have case information um, in it. Next slide, please. So um, it's probably hard for everyone to see this. Um, put your eyeball up next to the screen. Um, I think this is why we receive a lot of uh, questions about why don't I have a case and or why is it saying that I am not retained for the case or no LSRP is retained for the case that I have picked. And this illustrates um, the process just quickly going from left to right. This is the us removal case creation scenarios. So on the left, we have a kind of a peach um, rectangle with knocked off corners. And that is an us only retention service. And then, um, so a lot of LSRPs will want to either just file an NOI or they will be responsible for pulling the case, pulling the UST, or they will be responsible for pulling the UST. And then all of the subsequent um, remedial activities that might occur after that. And we have no idea, you know, of knowing what that scope is at that point. So um, the scope for that is um, really filing the, um, the uh, NOI at that point. So if we move to the right, the NOI gets filed after the retention and the LSRP has an opportunity to pick an existing case um, if there is one. Um, if they, if they um, do pick an existing case, then basically that um, closure service will get linked into the existing case. If not, um, the system determines whether the us are in compliance or not. So we're on the, you know, that one, right? And then if they are in compliance, um, you know, we'll continue on. If they are not in compliance, then the new case will be created, you know, and we go down to where the new case is created. So going on from there, if the us is never removed, obviously it's an end point. If the us is removed, then we determine, you know, is has been contamination been found? If contamination is found, then the incident gets called in and then a CDN is filed, right? And the CDN doesn't pick a case, then a new case is created. So if no contamination is found, you know, we continue in the upper bar to the right again, we file the um, FCQ showing that the US has been pulled. And if no case exists, then US registration staff will create the case, okay? So after the case is created, um, we ask the LSRP to file a retention to claim that case. A lot of LSRPs go, but I already filed a retention, you know, but specifically it was for pulling the us or filing the uh, notice of intent to close. And we need you to claim that case so that we know somebody is responsible for it. Um, once you claim the case, then you can file the fee service and then finally, you can file the report that you came in to do in the first place, file that SI, you know, for that US tank removal. So hopefully you can come back and review this. Um, you know, later we're going to try to make this available somewhere so that everybody can take a look at it in more detail. Next slide, please. We're getting toward the end. So this is... Um, an email from online services is sent out, and if a case is created, you should be able to find the case uh, in the attachment to the email in the online system, to the email that you receive after you file in the online system. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, after the case is created, we really would like you to go ahead and claim that case if you hadn't done so before. File that retention. Um, the only exception is probably for um, retention childcare. The staff who deals with the retention childcare usually tries to put the LSRP in there. Um, you can check that by running the LSRP comprehensive report, which shows um, cases that you are have been retained for. Um, but again, especially if you filed a retention previously, but it was us only and it didn't pick a case, you know, please go in and file that retention and pick that case and then you'll be assured that you'll be able to smoothly upload um, you know, any reports that you have to the online system. So that's all I have, any questions?
Thank you, Scott. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. I said there's a couple that have come in, um, and I will um, get some of those right now. Uh, this is a particular question. is a SID question. Um, under the same PI, but a different activity, there is another firm working at a site. Does the LSRP need to include those um, areas of concern as part of their SID? And if not, and they did, can they remove them? Um, yeah, they, there's a couple of scenarios here. Um, say there's two cases and there's, um, you know, two spill cases under two different owners. Um, they're they're going to be given, you know, REOs to, a, to their own AOC. So those uh, AOCs shouldn't be in, you know, in those, um, you know, different, they should have their own set of AOCs. And you can email the NJD online support email box and we'll get the process started to remove any AOCs that don't belong, uh, you know, in those cases. And it's really important to focus those um, AOCs in that case because when BIR goes to close that case and they find extra AOCs in it that don't have REOs yet, they are going to have trouble, you know, with it and it's going to have a lot of back and forth on that. Um, the exception is probably ISRA, and we're going to be training on this Thursday, February 18th. Uh, the training might be full, but there might still be slots for that. We're going to do SID training. So if you if you have the latest, if you have an ISRA trigger and there are previous cases in that, in the latest ISRA trigger, all of the AOC should be included. And in the SID training, we're going to go over how to include those properly um, so that in that case, people understand what it belongs to that case and what belongs to the other cases. Okay, we have another question. Um, when saving the SID file, do you have to maintain the .xism extension, otherwise the portal will reject it? Yeah, currently it's um, XLSM. Um, it's a macro enabled um, spreadsheet so that it can do the initial internal checking, you know, within that. And if you save it as XLSX or some other extension and then change it back, you've probably broken it and you need to, you know, go ahead and, and get another one from us. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, another question, do I have to be retained as LSRP to submit the NOI? Um, no, it doesn't check for the retentions, um, but you should. Um, I, I, I'm, that's actually, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm not really sure. We can get back to you about that. Um, the NOI requires an LSRP and enforces requiring an LSRP. It doesn't check whether you are the LSRP, um, but I'm not really sure. You know, usually the LSRP retention is first. And then the NOI is filed just like I had in my um, slide, but I'd have to refer back to the, the rules to see when exactly and who is required to file a retention for that. Thank you. We also have a question that um, I'm going to ask you to email um, Gary Sanderson at the Remedial Action Permitting Program. Um, this is a question about do you uh, how do you issue an unrestricted use REO at the end of a wrap? Um, you don't, you're not required, and based on my knowledge, you're not required to issue an unrestricted use REO at the end of the wrap. The termination of permit in conjunction with your restricted use or limited restricted use REO constitutes unrestricted use. But I would suggest you confirm that with the permitting program. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I think that if there isn't guidance on that, there will be guidance on that. We have another so question. Will the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bill, it's Christina. Before Scott gets off the SID subject, I just wanted um, to remind Scott, uh, we had talked about uh, letting people know that when people send SIDs in uh, through the SID converter, that they're not emailing an actual person. They're, it's, it's a program. So I think um, Joe Aiello was mentioning that there are issues with that. People think that they're, they're emailing a person and they're not. So... Do you know what I'm talking about, Scott? Yeah, I do, and I appreciate you bringing that up because, um, yeah, we've been asked specifically to, you know, mention not to reply to the SID conversion email box from, you know, once once you get the SID back, and um, 
don't send that box anything that doesn't have a SID attached to it. Uh, it, it really can clog up the converter and you know we may have trouble with it. And no one's supposed to be monitoring that box. So you know, just don't send stuff, send questions to the usual place, um, DP online support email address. And we've been really um, trying to get to everybody as soon as possible in there. Um, so we know it's a it's a it's a brave new world, and we're really trying to help as soon as we can, you know, with with any questions that you have. Be before I go to the next question, I just want to point out that uh, in the comment field, we do have somebody commenting that they sent in a SID for conversion and they got it back in the same day. So uh, kudos to DEP for um, handling something, so developing a system to handle it that quickly. We have another question. Will the case number generated for the UST closure be different from the UCL activity number? Yes, the case generated is always an LSR. Everybody keeps saying LSR, 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 and that's what it is. It's going to be LSR 21, and then however many cases were generated this year. So probably 21, 0, 0, 0, 001, you know, this year. All right, we have a question specific to Matt. Although the NJDEP maintains one PI per site, if the initial PI name has nothing to do with the current case, can we change the case name? And if so, what's the best way to go about doing that? Uh, short answer is yes. A lot of, I know a lot of PIs, if there's like an old ISRA trigger from 1985 and the PI still named it for that company that triggered 30 years ago. Um, in that case, yeah, we can change it. We typically like to change it to something more general. So if there's like a multi-tenanted industrial building, we'll say industrial building at 401 East State Street or something like that. Um, the only time we really can't change it is when the there is an active USD registration there. In that case, we would keep the PI name the same as whoever is the, whatever the site name is on the USD registration. Thank you, Matt. Uh, another question, how or who can be contacted in order to untangle incorrect XREF activity numbers? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, um, but you can contact definitely Maria or myself, or you can contact our SRWM underscore NGEMS, and we can try to figure out what the issue is. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? All right. I just want to I want to thank the uh, the panelists for joining us today, Matt, Maria, Tyrone, and Scott. Uh, appreciate your time. Um, I want to thank uh, for uh, Lynn and Chris. I want to thank all the panelists for joining today. Um, I think this was a very informative session, and I hope that our audience um, gained a lot of valuable information from that. And I want to thank the audience for joining us. Um, it was a lot of uh, fun bringing it to you. So, thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you.